Let's go back over here to this map. The fire yesterday grew down towards the south a little bit and then a little bit to the east. And that's primarily because of uh, the jagged edges of the fire when it did, did the first big push on Wednesday. Um, and, then, uh, um, and, and then the road here, the uh, Osborne Cutoff, this road here has did, done a really good job of assisting us in keeping that, that fire line um, uh, solid and contained. Um, today, the weather report is uh, 95 degrees with a relative humidity of 16. Um, that does uh, contribute to rapid fire growth, yet at the same time, it's supposed to be calmer winds. So it allows our crews to really get out there and get those uh, lines uh, really established all the way around the fire, um, and as well as making those uh, containment lines even stronger. Um, so that's really where we're at with the fire. Uh, minimal growth in the last 24 hours, um, but overall crews are making great headway in, in, uh, in being able to get the fire contained before we get in our triple digits uh, projected for uh, tomorrow and Sunday. Any questions regarding that? Yeah, how pivotal is it uh, to get as much of this fire knocked down as possible before the temperatures rise? Very, I mean, uh, it's, it's uh, when we get the triple digits, this time of year, relative humidity drops, we get wind, and then fire growth is very, very rapid. Um, the, 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 the fuels within this fire area are grass. It's a fine fuel. We all know how quickly grass burns when it's dry and there's a wind behind it. Um, plus, we have oak and pine trees uh, throughout, and those burn hot, and then they throw embers into the air, and then the wind throws them. Uh, the report on uh, Wednesday, during the big push of the fire, uh, those were, embers were going almost a half mile ahead of the fire front. And the other guys who been with yesterday, you know, who are on Shiloh, um, evacuating. How long do you anticipate the level three evacuation to be in place for that part of the fire? It all depends on what happens today and tomorrow. And then depending on how today and tomorrow goes, also what happens on Sunday. So it's really a progressive day, day, day by day. We work directly with Wasco County Sheriff's Office, who's in charge of the evacuation areas. And as, uh, as we work with them about fire growth and the potential, as well as weather, then we continue to reevaluate those evacuation areas. Can you comment about changes to the firefight with the coronavirus pandemic ongoing? Um, has that led to any additional changes? We've talked a bit about how crews have had to keep a distance and whatnot, but can you talk about any additional changes? Yeah, absolutely, and I'm gonna request we create our six feet of physical distancing so we can set a good example. Um, it, uh, we had time to plan for this. Not a whole lot of time, but we had time to plan. When March occurred and we had the COVID uh, really hit the state of Oregon, uh, the governor stepped in with Oregon Health Authority and, um, and really worked on how we are not only were responding within the state at that time, but also looking at fire season. We knew that there was a potential that we would be still working with COVID and we'd be fighting fire. So with the uh, governor's office, with uh, Oregon Department of Forestry and Oregon State Fire Marshal's office, we created a working group that put together a COVID module. We, uh, the document is a 90 some day page, uh, 96 page document uh, of best practices. And basically it's a guideline or a roadmap for us to uh, mitigate and, and work with a COVID-like environment in while we're out here doing fires. Um, and just to talk briefly on that, um, we came up with the, this roadmap, the guidelines, where we brought in a COVID module. It's three individuals, a health advisor, and then two paramedics who are there to assist with assessment. All of us went through a health screening before we even came to the fire. Everybody in camp, we go through a health screening daily, and then we have continual health assessments throughout. On top of it, we've, cr we've created pods with the work groups and separated the living conditions. You'll see out here in the camp that uh, the, the tents are all not packed together. That's because we're separating the working group pods so that if there's an exposure, it's not spread throughout camp. On top of it, we've created a bubble, if you will, between us and the community. The community's already dealing with COVID. We don't want to bring COVID to them, nor do we want to get COVID from them. So by creating the, the bubble and the pods, it, it isolates us uh, along with the physical distancing, wearing the face pieces, and good hygiene. 
Anything that you want, I guess, the community to know? I know things change in an instant, but especially this weekend as we're going to be getting hot. Um, really, we just ask for them to continue the way they're supporting us already. They're following the guidelines that the Was Wasco County Sheriff's Office has been asking. Um, we ask them to support us by uh, allowing us to get around town so that we are not, so that they're not interfering with our operation. Stay away from the fire line. Again, that physical distancing is important. And if we're having to have face-to-face -face conversations with the residents out where they're not supposed to be, that's not helpful. Um, and if the, if, if the fire growth does occur over the weekend with the uh, triple digits, um, we don't have to be wor want to worry about the life safety component along with the, uh, with all, along with the firefighting component. And you know, I want to go back to that COVID um, uh, question you asked earlier. We as firefighters, we want to focus our 100% attention on fighting fire, not COVID, which is why we brought in the COVID module with us. Then those three individuals can worry about that. They can take that worry or that, that planning, that, that interaction away from us to have to worry about so that we can focus on firefighting. How many uh, people are on the, on the fire? 381. And how many structures do we work? Uh, we are still reporting four structures. Two of those structures uh, are residences. Um, you may have already heard that uh, um, you know the, the, those residents are already speaking, and um, and we really want to say, as as Oregon State Fire Marshal's Office and Oregon Department of Forestry, our hearts go out to them. That uh, a property loss it, that's a tragedy. However, the system worked. Okay, when that fire came, they got notification. They were able to get out, grab their things, and where there is then no uh, no injury or no life loss, that's really our goal is to is to protect lives primarily. So they did an awesome job of getting out of their homes, um, and uh, and we again it's still a tragedy, a loss of a home, and our hearts go out to them. So far, there's been one home of the four structures. Do you any update on that? We now uh, have registered two residences. Um, we're not ready to release those numbers or the exact addresses yet. We'll be working on that. What's been the biggest um, I guess, struggle with this fire when it comes to fighting? Uh, that's a great question. It's a, it's a, it's a Can you first... repeat the question? So what's the biggest struggle when it comes to fighting? The biggest struggle for us is we haven't done firefighting with COVID. So we're building a first time camp in a way that yes, we planned for, but we hadn't done it. So being able to put those plans into practice in real life and then having the nuances occur that occurs and adjusting to that, that's been probably the biggest struggle. On the upside, this is Oregon Department uh, of Forestry incident management team, um, uh, a type one team and team one, working with Oregon State Fire Marshal's blue team. We've worked together before at multiple fires. And because we already have that working relationship, and that one team mentality, we were able to come in and unify, work as one team while dealing with COVID and focusing on the fire. So it really is beneficial when we have local incident management teams and local crews who have worked together, uh, stepping into an environment that we haven't actually done this before. You said it was a, I thought it was a type two team. Oregon State Fire Marshal's Office is a type two team. Yeah. Oregon Department of Forestry is a type one team. Thank you. Have you brought in any special equipment like air tankers or do you plan to do that or anything like that? Uh, right now we have nine assigned aircraft to this fire um, and they have been working very, very hard about uh, 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 providing the necessary support from air support. Um, the nice thing about air support is they're not sharing space and they're not working next to each other. So for as far as COVID guidelines, it's easy. Um, so having them available and being able to help, especially with that initial attack, was key. As far as an air taker, I have not heard anything. Is containment still at 10 percent? Yes, ma'am. 10 percent containment. What is the, the line at? I think it was like around 70 or 75 percent line around it. Right. And there, and I want to make sure that everybody understands the difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, a line means we've taken a dozer line, a dozer blade, whether it's 12 feet, um, whatever the blade of the dozer, or a hand line. A hand crew comes through and creates a hand line. That's a line around the fire. Mm -hmm. That does not contain a fire, especially when we're dealing with wind. Okay, right. it doesn't take much wind to throw an ember across that line, and and then we have a slop over and, and fire continues. Are you going to be doing a burning out from any of those dozer lines? Uh, those have been already ongoing yesterday. 
um, and that will continue as needed. Is there a certain flank that's causing our issues when it comes to lining? Uh, really, the whole uh, containment area that is the hardest concern, the, this is a canyon. The wind comes right up this canyon and is pushing this fire south and to the east. Um, our containment challenges all exist down here. And as long as we get the, the lower winds and we're able to uh, and we're able to really continue to get good work down there, um, we can get those lines in and then get them uh, to a level where we can call them containment lines. How many entities are here, like uh, fire marshals and, and all of these structural entities from around the state? How many are there? We have eight uh, structural task forces from eight, actually nine counties, Lincoln and Polk are together. Um, through, and then Central Oregon has uh, multiple counties involved, but eight task forces from throughout the state have come in. Uh, Oregon Department of Forestry has brought in crews from all over the state, and then the private entities, the private contractors are also uh, here fighting the fire. Yeah, I saw somebody from Bandon. Wow. Really yeah. Well, really, when, when uh, and for all of you that have covered wildfires in the past, um, it's about Oregonians helping Oregonians. Any other questions? No other questions. Anything else that you want to add that we haven't asked you? Um, really, I just want to, uh, I really want to uh, acknowledge the crews and the team and the support from the governor's office on down. Again, we've never done this before with COVID and being able to have the planning with the working group, being able to have the teams that have come together that have worked together, and then the crews and the hard work they're doing out there on the around the fire, it's really going well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Rich. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.